This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending MPC's first uh, in an aldermanic webinar series. Um, my name is Dan Cooper, and I am responsible for the uh, directing the research initiatives here at MPC. Uh, the basic idea of the webinar series is to help candidates for city council to think like legislators for the city and not just potential representatives of their wards. In other words, candidates, candidates may be running on a platform of graffiti removal in Lincoln Square or pothole repair in Chatham, but may underestimate the degree to which they will be asked to vote on issues that affect the whole city, such as transit, water supply, affordable housing, pension funding, among many others. We want to give them some relevant, relevant info to think about those citywide issues. So we hope that by offering that information, we can accomplish the following. Uh, outreach. We'd like to build relationships with a group of civically engaged people. Candidates for city council are a natural audience for that kind of relationship building. We also want to inform public officials when they take office. We hope that the info we provide them will help them make better decisions for the city council and for all residents of the city. Um, we also develop uh, future content based on the trends we see happening uh, around some of the important issues we're all working on. We'd like to create some content for use as part of a voter guide series. Uh, so each webinar will be about an hour. There will be two to three speakers on each webinar. Um, and we will divide up the time uh, according to the topics at hand. Uh, because of the number of participants, everyone will be kept on mute for the duration of this webinar. We invite you to join the conversation by submitting questions using the chat function on your screen. You can find this chat function in your GoToMeeting control panel toward the bottom. When you submit your comments, you'll only be chatting with us. No one else will see your comments or who else is on the webinar. Um, as I said, there are, there are going to be three speakers today, and the time will be divided up evenly, um, going over demographic changes and some of our work around promoting greater equity and understanding the costs of segregation. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Dan Cooper. We also have uh, with us Marisa Navarro, who is uh, a VP at MPC, and Shahara Was, who um, also uh, engages in research across all our program areas. Great. And there are our lovely smiling faces for all of you to see. Uh, and we will also have contact info for all of us um, afterwards if anyone likes to get in touch. Um, and all of us have content and more information about us and our work up on the website as well. Um, so to kick things off, I'm just going to give a general overview of some of the broader demographic trends we're seeing in Chicago and the broader region uh, that will affect all of us as residents um, and you all as potential uh, governors of your area and the city. Um, so the first graphic um, is not uh, uh, a hopeful one at the moment. So if you look at some of the largest metropolitan areas, um, Chicago is in light blue um, at the bottom. So out of all these large regions, uh, looking at LA, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and DC, um, the Chicago region is the only one that lost population over the last several years. Um, so this is something you've probably all heard about, um, that we're not growing as fast as our peers, um, and population loss um, has impacts for us in a number of ways, obviously for generating tax revenue, for growing jobs, growing the economy. Um, population growth is a very important thing. And in particular, looking in this, at the city, one thing we want to point everyone's attention to is the lack of growth or the loss of population in the city is largely driven by a loss in the African-American population. Um, an analysis we did looking between the years of 2010 and 2015, we found that over 60,000 African-Americans left uh, the city of Chicago. Um, other populations have remained relatively stable, or as we're gonna see in a second, um, we're, we're also seeing trends in uh, the Latino population uh, leaving the city. So here's just a quick graphic to demonstrate uh, the black population is seen in the red line, and you can see for the last uh, decade and more, we have been 
uh, losing black population while the white population has grown. Uh, the Hispanic population has also grown, but in more recent years has leveled off and is now falling slightly. So this graphic um, expresses this in a different way, looking at the percentage change. Uh, and here we can see uh, over the last three years uh, where we have data available, 2015 through 2017, you see in red the Hispanic or Latino population. So that growth rate has turned negative um, and we are, are not seeing growth. We're actually seeing a shrinking population among Latinos. Uh, and again, looking at the African-American population in orange, um, that growth rate is also declining. Um, while the white population and Hispanic populations are both growing. So this, uh, this trend, when we dig a little deeper to understand um, this, this uh, trend among the Latino population, it's a specific population that we're typically seeing uh, a decline in. It's uh, those with lower educational attainment and those who are uh, lower income. Uh, so you can see what sticks out in this graph. You'll see the blue uh, line where we see a jump from 2016 to 2017 in the percentage change of immigrant population. And this is the high, highest educated population, those with a bachelor's degree or higher. Um, so we are doing a, uh, a good job as a city of attracting uh, immigrant populations with a higher educational attainment. Um, not so great in um, those who uh, do not have um, a diploma or um, uh, or a, a higher income. Now we're going to zoom out a little bit and think about um, this immigrant population uh, in our region compared to some of our peers. Um, so if you look at this graph, you see that uh, immigrants do not make up as large of a proportion of our population um, as, as many other areas like New York and Los Angeles, for example. Um, our region has relied on strong international immigrations for our population growth over the years, um, particularly uh, 10 years ago, even five years ago, um, but that is starting, starting to change. Um, and just as a note, the term immigrant or foreign born refers to people residing in the United <laughs> States who were born not as US, who are not US citizens at birth. So when we look back at the growth and change in our city, um, we see a couple things that stand out to us. So over the last uh, 20 years, um, just a quarter of our census tracts changed uh, a racial majority. Uh, sorry, this is the Chicago region, not just the city. Majority Latino census tracts uh, are five times more likely to change than our African-American census tracts. Uh, what this basically means is that racial integration in our region is fleeting. More and more, we're comprised of segregated spaces, segregated white spaces, uh, and also segregated uh, black spaces. So the poles of race and income are most intractable. So when you look at this graphic, what stands out, um, you can see in yellow in the middle and in blue at the bottom, you see that um, basically, these two white and high income neighborhoods and black and low income neighborhoods are the least likely to have changed over this 20 year period. Um, other areas, when you see, for example, Latino neighborhoods, um, they're much more likely to see a change in population, say a mixing and influx of white residents, for example. Um, so this also means that Latino neighborhoods are much more likely to face uh, displacement pressures than are um, black uh, neighborhoods or white neighborhoods. So when we look forward, uh, this graph projects out to 2030, and this was done with our partners at Urban Institute. Um, we see that the population is projected to, these trends are projected to increase. Um, looking at Chicago on the far left, you see that we're projecting uh, almost a 20% decrease in the black population between, 20, between now and, and 2030. Um, an increase in the white population, and a relatively stable Latino population. Um, when you zoom out to suburban Cook County, here's where we are projecting a much bigger growth in Latino population, a decline in white population, um, and, and a relatively stable black population. And then zooming out further to the collar counties, um, we also see 
uh, project to see an, an in, increase in Latino populations uh, and black populations. And we would also point you to um, some blog posts in our data point series done by MPC um, over the past year that really dig deeper into the population loss in Chicago done by our, our colleague Alden Lowry, um, showing that uh, the, the black population is actually moving uh, elsewhere out of the collar counties and the region to, to places like Texas uh, and other states. So um, one of the big stories is um, Chicago's slow growth um, or population loss uh, and our, our inability to, to attract and retain um, populations of color. <clears throat> so thinking about uh, income, here's another graph where our partners at Urban Institute helped us project out to 2030. Um, we see that the low income population is projected to stay pretty flat, um, whereas we're gaining high income populations. The opposite is, the, is true of suburban Cook County and even more so in the collar counties. Um, the collar counties and the suburbs we, and close in suburbs, we project will be gaining low income residents and losing uh, high income residents. So what this all means is that Chicago is increasingly a tale of two cities. Uh, this map made by one of our colleagues, Daniel K. Hertz, shows that in 1970, we had a fairly uh, integrated city in terms of income, right? We had a lot of middle-class neighborhoods, which are shown in gray, that's around the median. Um, and we had a smattering of high-income neighborhoods and some low-income neighborhoods. Now, moving to the right, you see that that's changed drastically. Those middle-income neighborhoods around the median um, have all but disappeared, and we see a polarized geography of high-income neighborhoods, high-status neighborhoods, and low-income neighborhoods. So what this translates to over 40 years is that we went from having uh, 18 to 23 high-status neighborhoods, we went from having 29 to 45 low-status communities, and uh, we, went, we dropped from 30 to nine middle-income or middle-status communities. So the shrinking middle uh, and increasingly a polarized city of, of high income and low income areas. So what, what is behind this income? Obviously jobs are a big part of it, um, jobs and income. And so this map shows job growth, um, job rate, job growth rates for, for different metro areas. Chicago is in light blue and unfortunately we're also at the bottom here. So you can see from 2014 to 2017, the job growth rate has slowed um, and a little bit faster than some of our peer metropolitan areas. So um, attracting businesses, attracting jobs, and more importantly, attracting jobs that will pay a living wage uh, and, and deal with unemployment in a fair and equitable way are issues that all aldermen should be aware of and thinking of. Here's the last slide I'm gonna show before turning it over to my colleague Shahara. Um, but this also shows that wage growth is in inexorably tied to educational attainment. Um, so the top two lines on the graph show those with a graduate or professional degree and those with at least a bachelor's degree. Um, so what you can see is over the last, like that wage growth has largely been stable, but in the last couple of years, we've seen an uptick um, in the earnings of those with, uh, who are more educated, who have a, at least a bachelor's degree or a graduate professional degree. Um, ultimately we're attracting, our jobs are attracting professionals who are high, highly educated and that's where our wage growth is. Um, we're not doing as well of a job as in, in growing the wages of those who do not have a college degree. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Shahara Was, who's going to continue discussing some of the important demographic changes. Uh, and finally, Marisa Navarro, who's going to tell us what this all means um, for equitable policies and what we should be thinking moving forward to growing this region in an equitable manner. Okay, great. All righty. Thanks, Dan. Um, so on the last slide, we shared a graphic about the ways in which educational attainment affects wage growth. And that's a topic that we uh, dived into a little bit last year. So um, MPC built off of the living wage calculator, which is a tool that was developed by researchers uh, at MIT. And from that, we estimated the share of households in the city um, and the metro area that are able to earn a living wage. So our analysis found that as of 2016, individuals in the city of Chicago without a college degree were two and a half times more likely to earn less than living wage standards than those who have a degree. 
So clearly, um, educational attainment uh, does make a pretty large difference in, in quality of life and this living wage attainment. Um, we also found as the graphic displays significant racial disparities in who is able to earn a living wage uh, in the region. So in Metro Chicago, you'll see on the bar graph, 67.5% of black households don't earn a living wage um, as compared to only 43.5% of white households. And similarly, 60.8% of Latino households uh, don't earn a living wage. This next slide here is uh, showing overall Metro uh, living wage attainment. So in Metro Chicago overall, uh, about half, so 49.6% of our households uh, are not able to earn a living wage. So this sets us um, uh, at a pretty high standard. And so you'll see comparison regions like DC and Boston, uh, as well as New York City and LA uh, on this graph as well. Um, another thing that we often talk about when we think about equity here at MPC um, is our education system. Uh, so the launch of ProPublica's miseducation database last year revealed the latest numbers on performance measures for school districts across the state. Uh, and we found the numbers on disciplinary outcomes within CPS to be uh, pretty shocking. So the most recently collected data shows that within CPS, uh, African-American students on average make up 75% of annual expulsions. Uh, and Latino students make up 24%. Uh, and those uh, uh, racial groups both far exceed uh, what's seen for white students, uh, uh, where white students make up around 1% uh, of annual expul expulsions. Um, for out-of-school suspensions, you'll see similarly uh, high rates. So black students make up 66% of those uh, that experience out-of-school suspensions. Latino students make up 28%, and white students make up 4%. So you'll see on this uh, graphic here, this, this confirms these trends. So this graphic comes from UChicago's Consortium on School Research. Um, and, and this confirms the ways in which students of color uh, and particularly African-American males are disproportionately targeted by disciplinary measures. So if we pay attention to the right-hand side of this graph, this is looking at uh, high schoolers within CPS. And we're looking um, from 2008 onwards up to 2014. Um, and if you pay attention to that trend line at the top in blue, uh, you'll see that it's African-American males that are experiencing in-school suspensions at far higher rates than those for uh, Latino, white, or Asian males and females. So this is definitely a trend that we need to be paying attention to. Um, in addition, when we look at overall uh, CPS school performance, the numbers are uh, also very troubling. Um, so in their report, Raising Quality, Promoting Equity, um, IFF uncovered the gap in school performance within CPS as compared to the state of Illinois. And they looked at the uh, ability of schools to prepare students uh, for proficiency at grade level in reading and math. And so they determined that as of 2017, uh, there are a high number of CPS students that are not able to uh, uh, let their students achieve proficiency. So they used a grading system uh, for the district giving out grades from A through F based on proficiency standards. And they found that as of 2017, 88% of CPS students are not able to access an A, B, or even C rated school in the district. And that compares to 74% uh, of students in the state of Illinois. Uh, and that's what you see on the bar chart uh, on the left. So unsurprisingly, they also found that uh, only the most economically prosperous communities in the district have access to a meaningful number of schools that have achieved these proficiency standards for reading and math. Um, and those same high achieving A and B rated schools, they tend to underrepresent uh, students of color or students from low income backgrounds um, in their student body. So uh, Dan earlier in the slideshow mentioned the uh, city and region's loss of African-American residents. And that's a trend that we can see observed in uh, CPS enrollment data. So we conducted an analysis in late 2017, uh, and we found that black student enrollment in CPS has declined uh, every year since at least 1998, which is the earliest year for which CPS has available data. We also found uh, that enrollment of Latino students who make up the largest proportion of the CPS student population uh, had dropped for the fourth year in a row. And so in terms of concrete numbers, when you look at the drop uh, between fall 2016 and fall 2017, you'll see the Latino student enrollment uh, numbers dropped by around 2% or around 10,000 students. Um, and aside from the last three years, uh, uh, we know that Latino enrollment in recent history has only dropped once, dating back to uh, 1999. 
So when we look at this in the aggregate and we look at Latino and black student enrollment, uh, we saw that overall CPS enrollment has fallen more in the last four years than it had during any four year stretch over the past 20 years. Um, we also note uh, that per pupil spending for select school systems uh, is something that we also need to be pay pay paying attention to. Um, so Chicago is um, at the, or just above the school average. So for the United States, you'll see there in that line in gray on the graph, per pupil spending is around $11,700. So uh, we CPS, uh, we're a little bit above this, but it's important to pay attention uh, to these numbers given the uh, drastic enrollment uh, declines that we've seen. So another thing that um, we often talk about here when we talk about equity issues um, is affordable housing. So uh, we did an analysis late last year where we looked at uh, affordable housing distribution across the city, and we found that Chicago's whitest and wealthiest wards are not providing their fair share of affordable housing uh, in the city. So we looked at the share of uh, rental housing units in each of the city's uh, wards, and we found that in 11 of those wards, and these are the areas of the map that are in the lightest yellow, um, these are areas all on the north and northwest sides of the city. Uh, affordable housing units make up less than 2.5% um, of all rental housing in those areas. And when you look at the demographics in those wards, a few things stand out. So the resident population is majority white, and the median household income is around $80,000. Uh, on average. And then on the other hand, if you look at those areas that are in red, uh, those are uh, the 21 wards in the city where affordable housing makes up over 10% of rental housing stock. Um, and across those 21 wards, the demographics look quite different. So residents of color make up almost 90% of the population on average, and the median household income is just over $43,000. So that's about half the median household income of that other group. Um, so those distinct groups are a pretty powerful visualization of our city's uh, legacy of segregation. And we know the map didn't come to look this way on accident. So MPC, as well as other advocacy organizations like the Chicago Area Fair Housing Alliance have made mention of um, aldermanic prerogative as being one reason that the map looks this way. So aldermanic prerogative, the historic practice of aldermen uh, to delay or block new housing developments. Uh, this has, has happened many times in our history, especially in response to pressure from constituents in wards uh, to maintain uh, status quo racial composition. So um, as a city, if we've only prioritized affordable housing development in some areas, which you can see on the map, um, then we're limiting the choices that everyone should get to make about where they're able to live, uh, regardless of income level. And you'll hear from Marisa in just a little bit about our equitable future, which is our uh, policy roadmap where we've outlined recommendations to address uh, this issue and other equity issues. So um, we've conducted analyses in the past that also tell us that we need to be paying attention to um, rental markets and uh, homeowner markets. So as an example, we looked at the resiliency of homeowner markets uh, post-recession in Cook County. Um, and we found uh, that if you lived in a majority black community between 2013 and 2015, uh, there's a really high likelihood that your neighborhood experienced some of the highest single family home uh, depreciation rates in the county. Um, so we did an analysis and we re released these results uh, mid last year. Um, so of the 40, there are 60 uh, census block groups that we looked at uh, for the highest depreciation and highest uh, uh, appreciation rates across the county. And the analysis showed that 42 of the 60 census block groups with the highest depreciation rates um, housed people of color majority populations. Um, and then in contrast, 47 of those 60 census tracts with the highest appreciation rates uh, were majority white. So that definitely tells us something about uh, uh, equity in our region. And when we look at how Chicago compares to pure regions, however, uh, this story of resiliency is largely a middle class one. So uh, we took note of a Brookings Institution analysis that came out uh, last year uh, that looked at single family home uh, price to income ratios for several uh, regions across the nation. So um, this uh, analysis from Brookings found Chicago had the lowest price to income ratio on average, but it was largely uh, only a story um, uh, for middle class uh, uh, communities. Um, especially when you compare to other regions like DC, New York, or Los Angeles. 
Um, so this last slide here uh, um, is one that shows the importance of paying, atten uh, paying attention to the transportation sector when we're thinking about equity. Um, in March of 2017, uh, we released some findings that revealed dramatic racial disparities uh, when we look at commute time for residents in the city. So um, we looked at uh, data from 2012 to 2016, um, and we found that all of the top 20 census tracts where residents had the longest commutes in the region uh, were located in Chicago proper. Um, and in those 20 census tracts, at least 80% of the population is represented by non-white residents, so Black or Latino residents. Um, and in contrast, uh, for the census tracts where residents are experiencing the lowest commute, so about 22 to 27 minutes, 17 of those are white majority. So when you look at the uh, graphs, I'm sorry, the maps on this slide, you note the spots that are in red reflect those census tracts where residents experience the longest commutes. Um, and the blue uh, are tracts where residents experience the shortest commutes. Um, on the left-hand side, those darker green areas represent um, areas of highest African-American resident concentration. So pretty much all of those uh, red tracks are in those uh, hyper-concentrated areas. And then on the right-hand side, the reverse is happening. So those dark green areas represent uh, those areas of highest white resident concentration. So the exact reverse is happening. Um, they are all, the, the, all the resident uh, shortest commute tracks are in those uh, white concentrated areas. Um, so these are just a few of the trends that, that we think uh, kind of demonstrate the importance of paying attention to equity. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Marisa here to talk about uh, cost of segregation and our equitable future. Thanks, Shahara. And um, I will walk you through a two-part study that uh, we began back in November of 2015. So uh, this work began with two questions. Uh, we set out to answer the question of what it costs us to live so separately by race and income in the Chicago region, and then what we could do to create a more equitable region. And so the uh, report that you see on the left, the cost of segregation, we uh, released in March of 2017, and the Our Equitable Future roadmap on the right was um, in May of 2018. And we did this work, in, again, in partnership with the Urban Institute. So um, our first question, I will walk you through what we found, and then we will um, move into our roadmap for the future, and then we'll, um, then we'll be sure to answer questions that you can submit all throughout while I'm talking. Um, so what we did was to compare the Chicago region to the 100 largest metros across the country and look at changes that occurred um, in as racial and economic segregation went up and down between 1990 and 2010. We observed what changes also occurred to things like income, educational attainment, homicides, and life expectancy. What we saw was that overall across the 100 metros, metros that had lower racial and economic segregation, had higher incomes, lower homicides, and greater educational attainment. And then what we wanted to do was zero into Chicago because that is our home. And so um, we determined what the cost to Chicago is of not being at the median of those 100 metros. So I'll first show you uh, what we found when we ranked our metro across those 100. So in 2010, we were the fifth highest combined racial and economic segregation region, ninth highest for Latino white, 10th highest for black white segregation, and 20th for economic. And you may tend to think of Chicago as um, higher on that list, as in worse on that list. And that may be because uh, you're thinking of the city rather than the region. And we, we did need to do this analysis at the metro level. But at the city level, for instance, a 2017 study showed that um, Detroit was first most segregated city and Chicago was second, um, again, when you're looking just at cities. So we then get to the, uh, the answer to our question of uh, what does segregation cost us? And what we found, um, again, was the impact that we are foregoing by not being at the median rather than those uh, rankings that I shared with you. So we found impacts in lost income, lost lives, and lost potential. And I'll walk through quickly um, a bit more detail on each one of these. So in terms of lost income, what we found was that if we reduced our segregation to the national median, 
we would experience, we expect to experience another 4.4 billion in African American income, which translates to another 8 billion in regional GDP. So there's a ripple effect out from there. In terms of lost lives, um, just looking at the year 2016 alone, if we looked at the city and we applied that 30% drop, which was what we uh, what we found we could expect, that would have been an additional 229 lives saved in that year alone. We also know that there are ripple effects of, um, of our homicide rate. Um, it, it affects our real estate values. Um, it affects the incomes that um, are not being earned and policing and corrections costs as well. Of course, it goes without saying of um, you can't put a value on lost life. Finally, uh, we also found that uh, we would expect to see 83,000 more bachelor's degrees. And of course, those uh, degrees also result in higher lifetime earnings. So without them, we see a $90 billion total lifetime earnings gap uh, because of foregoing that. And um, I also wanted to show you uh, these, this is a map of the 100, the 100 largest metros and the ones that are the darkest orange that are labeled, those are the top 10 uh, highest combined racial and economic segregation in 2010. So it's important uh, to me to, to note in this is that all 10 of those highest are all great migration legacy cities. So we see that there aren't any in the South um, that in fact, when African-Americans in particular began in 1916, a movement to the North for jobs, the result um, was the mainly white populations in those cities enacted very strict rules about where those incoming populations could and could not live. And a hundred years later, we, we still experience that legacy and have maintained it across those hundred years through many ways. Finally, we were curious to understand if we were to reduce our segregation, what kind of timeline are we talking? And so we did some projections um, and noted that um, if we kept at our current pace of dropping, because we are actually dropping um, across um, economic black, white, and Latino white segregation, we have dropped over time. Were we to continue at that pace, you can see the dark orange bars here show that it would take us until 2070 to reach the median in black, white segregation. It would, um, that is the most profound um, gap that we have. Um, we, it looks that we would reach Latino white median between 2050 and 2060. We also did, because we did not have statistically significant results for, um, for Latinos, but we did do some additional research on impacts uh, to Latino populations uh, across the region. So if, if people have specific questions about that, we're happy to answer those. Um, so on to our report that we released uh, last year. This was, again, a roadmap to create a more racially equitable Chicago. And we really emphasized two distinct paths in this roadmap. And one is uh, kind of never ending and ongoing. And one is um, a path that we think uh, could be, we can make great headway on in the next two years. So I'll quickly walk through both of those. The first is um, an emphasis on racial equity. And we believe that government, the private sector, philanthropy, and nonprofits like MPC should adopt a racial equity framework. And the way this works is um, to examine one's budget. If you're in government, you, you'd be thinking about your laws, your ordinances, you're looking at hiring structures, and looking and at those for ways that you may be perpetuating inequities by race regardless of intent. And from there, we can shift the conditions that um, are holding the structures of racial, um, of racism in place. And so this is called systems change through a racial equity framework. And um, we're excited that there's been progress on this through many governments around the country. And we're starting to see um, some movement on that in um, the Cook County, for instance, and in uh, the Chicago Department of Public Health. And I'll say again, the MPC is also holding ourselves accountable um, to this work uh, in our organization as well. And then, as I mentioned, um, we have uh, about two dozen recommendations that um, we are pursuing and that we believe can be substantially 
achieved over the next two years. And some of those are projects that MPC is leading. Many are projects that others are in the lead on as um, their expertise is in the forefront and we are supporting. So I'll give just a couple examples, but you can find um, a very extensive write-up of all of this at www.metroplanning/roadmap. But I'll give you a couple examples. Um, one is to adopt a city-level earned income tax credit for working households. We have a federal, we have a state earned, uh, earned income tax credit. Um, our recommendation is to extend that to a city credit as well. The result would be if if you followed our model, another 218 million in additional spending. We are working on this project through the Resilient Families Task Force. Uh, another example is to eliminate the use of cash bail, which disproportionately negatively impacts young men of color. Um, this would save us money. We could save nearly 200 million per year by eliminating unnecessary pretrial detention. But more importantly, we would stop punishing people for simply being poor by removing them from their jobs, their families, and their communities for low-level offenses that they've not been convicted of. Uh, that this work is being led by Chicago Appleseed Fund for Justice Coalition and Money Bond, etc. Um, another one is to um, increase options uh, for people with housing choice vouchers. And so we know that more people um, in Chicago today have a housing choice voucher to help with their housing costs than live in actual public housing units. Yet, uh, for many folks, there are neighborhoods that are in which the rents are too high for them to use a voucher. So we noted eight neighborhoods where if we increase the, the rent ceiling by 33%, we could um, open up those neighborhoods to people who right now currently can't access them. Um, finally, we our view is that we need limits on aldermanic ability to reject or indefinitely delay affordable housing in wards that lack it. So we, we've worked on an ordinance in 2018 that delineates wards with less than 10% affordable housing. And we propose a different process for um, projects that include affordable housing in those wards that they would go through that there would be some um, time frames under which they would have to move forward. They could no longer be indefinitely delayed um, and they could not be rejected for non-fact-based reasons. Um, our view is that it's a basic notion that all communities need to contribute to the city's affordable housing needs. And then if that's our basic principle, then individual communities cannot be uh, allowed to opt out of that contribution. So those are a couple examples um, that are included in our roadmap. Uh, again, I would refer you to our website, www.metroplanning roadmap for lots and lots more details. Um, and we did also just do a six month update on uh, progress against that roadmap, which you can also find on our website with more up-to-date information about uh, progress that's been made through many of our partners um, on these goals. And so we thank you for your attention. Uh, you can reach us on Twitter through these handles and uh, we'd like to now be able to answer any questions that you've submitted. Thank you for listening, everyone. Uh, responding to one question, one of you pointed out that uh, in our graphic we shared earlier about wage growth, that uh, although it is expect as expected, we saw wage growth among high educated populations. We also saw, uh, and I failed to point out, um, an increase in the earnings of those without a bachelor or without a, co a high school degree. So um, I'll flip back to the slide for a second um, so you can see that. So basically what we're seeing is a polarization. We're seeing wage growth among the top, the most educated, but also wage growth among the very bottom. Um, and uh, mostly stagnation in the middle, those who don't have a college degree. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. That is helpful to, to note um, the polarization we see in wage growth. Uh, and we also welcome any other questions you might have and we will hang out and wait for your questions.
So uh, we received a question. Uh, somebody asked, uh, what are the implications of our, uh, our slow or no growth in population in our ability to pay for existing or future infrastructure? Uh, and this is a great question. And I think in general, uh, population, is, population growth is important for uh, growing our revenue base uh, and dealing with things like infrastructure. Um, so it is very important. It is tied to our ability to pay for infrastructure. Um, however, there are other avenues to, to getting at infrastructure funding, um, a gas tax, for example. Um, so there are other revenue solutions that could help fund infrastructure, and MPC has a number uh, of initiatives uh, and, and proposals, or we're working with a number of groups on proposals that would do just that. Uh, we also received a question to ask to go into more detail on the ordinance that provides some limits on aldermanic prerogative and um, uh, and its status. So uh, the, this ordinance, um, as I mentioned, uh, it sets up some parameters so that wards with uh, less than 10% affordable rental housing today, if they are proposed a development that includes affordable housing or triggers the ARO, um, then that project has 90 days uh, to go through um, the zoning committee or plan commission, whichever applies. And um, if it is rejected, it goes on automatic appeal to the zoning board of appeals, at which point um, it, that can only be overridden, um, or the it can only be sustained, the rejection can only be sustained for a fact-based reason. So some non-fact-based reasons um, that we hear a lot in public testimony are things like, um, I don't like tall buildings, or I like the semi-suburban feel um, of this neighborhood, or um, I'm afraid um, of the traffic and things of that nature. Um, when we have a traffic study, um, when we have an education, you know, school impact study and things of that nature, then um, we need to be able to speak to those fact-based reasons. Um, so that ordinance was introduced in July of 2018 with 27 co-sponsors. It is in the uh, Committee on Housing and Real Estate, and um, it is still in the committee and um, working through some issues. You may know that since that time, uh, the Shriver Center has um, sued for the disparate impact of aldermanic prerogative um, on protected populations. And so that um, lawsuit may in fact change the nature of how the ordinance moves forward. And we look forward to revisiting that with the new city council. Um, so we have also received a question. Um, do we know where people are moving to when they leave the city uh, by race or income? Um, and it's clear that uh, this urbanization of poverty is actually a trend that we need to be paying attention to. So there, um, there has been um, evidence of uh, residents that are facing um, affordability uh, uh, problems in the city. Um, we know that some of them are indeed moving to the Chicago suburbs. So we actually did an analysis um, late last year uh, and we noted that there was between 2010 and 2016, a 54% increase in suburban poverty uh, just outside the city limits. Um, we also know that uh, uh, beyond uh, the collar counties, uh, residents are also moving to um, other nearby metro areas, uh, uh, such as uh, Gary, Indiana. Um, and as our uh, colleague um, Alden Lowry had uh, published uh, late last year, um, or earlier last year, excuse me, um, we know that there are also residents, particularly residents of color, that are moving to um, areas such as um, Atlanta uh, and even, um, you know, areas in the Sun Belt, so uh, Houston and Phoenix. Um, and there are a number of data points, blogs, where we've published um, the numbers on, on those kinds of trends. Um, there was also a second part uh, of that question that I'll let Dan answer. Uh, in, in terms of industry, uh, we don't have data immediately available to, to answer the question about uh, where folks are moving, uh, what the demographics of folks moving for different jobs or different sectors. Um, but just to add just a little additional color to what Shahara mentioned, um, the trend of black population loss is, is shared in many other cities, particularly northern cities like Detroit, uh, New York City, um, Los Angeles, Baltimore, 
DC, all of these cities have, have lost black population over the past 10 years. Um, so Chicago is not alone, um, but it is a trend where we're seeing uh, a, a sort of reverse migration to uh, southern areas. Shahara mentioned Atlanta, um, Texas, um, and even other places in, in California. Um, but in general, uh, as people move out of uh, Chicago, um, they are, the majority of them across all racial and ethnic categories are moving to other parts of Cook County. All right, this is Marisa. Um, we have a question about kind of getting into a little bit of detail about affordable housing and the fact that um, when units, uh, affordable units are included in an otherwise market rate building, such as through the ARO or the Affordable Requirements Ordinance, then the um, income limit is 60% of the area median income or below. That is also the level that most low-income housing tax credit units are set for. Um, how, if you are a, a recipient of a housing choice voucher or formerly called a Section 8 voucher, then um, you can earn much, much less money than that and still uh, receive assistance with your housing. So um, some of the question gets at the, the wide swath of need that exists between um, the very, very low income all the way up to 60% of the area median income. In fact, just yesterday, I uh, was in a meeting of a community development corporation who did an audit of their waiting list for their low income housing tax credit units and found that 70% of those on their waiting list did not make enough money for their affordable units. So we know that 60% of the area median income, which is a federal, um, you know, is a federal level that's set, is often too high for many neighborhoods. Um, we know that the Chicago Housing Authority has shown uh, a commitment to getting more of their vouchers and their hard units in um, parts of the city that um, where they have not had a significant presence historically. And so that's one of the ways that we can try to ensure um, deeper levels of affordability for people is for developers to partner with, uh, with the housing authority and um, uh, to accept vouchers as well into buildings in areas where we don't see um, a lot of that level of affordability across the whole city. We received another question, somebody asking us to explain why it's important for the city to grow its low-income immigrant populations uh, and not just high-income and white population. I think that's a great question. Um, a couple things immediately come to mind uh, in terms of research evidence and not the sort of narratives we hear uh, uh, today right now about public safety is that um, immigration is typically good for public safety outcomes. Where we see influx of immigrant populations, we often see decreases in crime. Um, this is borne out through research uh, over decades across different cities and geographies. Um, and you know, unfortunately, we hear the opposite often um, in the press or when folks cherry pick a story about um, uh, some sort of some aspect of crime or you know by an immigrant, um, but public safety outcomes are tied to immigration. Job growth is also tied to immigration. So, so growing the immigrant population, I think is very important for um, all the other trends we, we talked about earlier in terms of job and wage growth. Um, the immigrant influx where we've seen in other periods of Chicago um, has ultimately been, been good for our economy um, and, for, and great for growing the tax base, for generating revenues um, for things like infrastructure and amenities that we all rely on to continue uh, attracting more residents and more jobs, more employers.
So with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, we thank you all for attending. Um, I wanted to remind you of a couple things. Number one, uh, this will be available um, on our website, and we'll also share with you this recording. Um, so you can go back and, and go over any part of it uh, as you desire. The contact information uh, for myself and my other co-presenters here are also listed, or you can find us on the website, and we're happy to answer any questions coming up. Um, also, most importantly, there are two more webinars coming up um, in, the, in the coming weeks, and we'll be sending out more information about them later, but we'll be diving into topics like housing, affordable housing, uh, and infrastructure. Um, and finally, uh, I should also mention that uh, MPC is uh, a nonprofit, nonpartisan uh, organization, so we don't endorse particular candidates, um, but we are very happy to be a resource to all of you, and we thank you for your participation, and we hope to stay engaged with all of you as you go forward uh, and make our city a better place. Thank you so much for your attendance.